Hello, and welcome to Rome 2, episode 0 0.5, Prologue. So, last time we went over the introduction, talked a little bit about what my plans are, and the future. So, we're going to jump right into it right now. We're going to go to the Grand Campaign, and we will obviously be playing as Roma, Dear Rome. So, Rome will rule the world. It is her destiny and always has been. Claiming a line of descent back to Hercules, Romans are not lacking in civic pride. Romans are not lacking in fierceness. Their city was founded by Romulus and Remus, twins raised by a wolf. Their armies may have been beaten, but they have always dragged themselves back into any fight and battled on. And now, surrounded by rivals and potential enemies, Rome faces challenges at every turn. He who rules in Rome can rule the world, but only through the glory of conquest. Playing as Rome, you get the bonuses Roman Legions, plus one recruitment slot in all your provinces, and Bread and Circuses, plus one food in all provinces. So, those are the bonuses of the Roman faction. Now, Rome also can play as three separate factions within Rome. These factions are going to basically be families. You're going to play as a Gens, so you can play as either the Gens Julia, the Gens Junia, or the Gens Cornelia. So we're going to go through each of them. The Gens Julia. Political tradition, republic. Special systems, reforms, auxiliary recruitment. Originally from Alba Longa, the Julii clan are an ancient patrician family, with a tradition of attaining high office dating back centuries. The most famous of the clan was Gaius Julius Caesar, who became lifelong dictator. Bonuses include barbarian subduers, increased melee attack during battles against barbarian tribes, and Romanization, increased cultural conversion. Drawback is cultural oppressors, increased public order penalties due to the presence of foreign culture. The next family is the Gens Junia. Their political tradition is a republic, their special systems, reforms, and auxiliary recruitment. Perhaps blessed by the goddess Juno, for whom the month of June is named, the Junii are one of the most respectable families in Rome. This reputation rests on the labors of Lucius Junius Brutus, who drove out the last Roman king, Tarquinius Superbus. Bonuses include agrarian wisdom, increased agricultural income, and founding fathers, public order bonus from Latin culture. Drawback is political elitists, moderate diplomatic penalty with all factions. The last family you can play is the Gens Cornelia. Their political tradition is also a republic, and their special systems are reforms and auxiliary recruitment. The Cornelii clan is among the most illustrious of Roman families. More become consuls, generals, and statesmen than from any other family. Among them, the Scipios and the Sullas are especially notable. Sulla Felix, the famous dictator, was a member of this family. Bonuses include administrators, increased tax rate, and philhellenes, moderate diplomatic bonus with all Hellenic factions. Drawback is disdain for the plebs, public order penalty from the presence of Latin culture. I plan to play the Gens Jun Julia. Uh, the Gens Julia is known for Gaius Julius Caesar, and Caesar is one of my favorite Romans, so we are going to play as him. Just to recap, his bonuses were Barbarian Subduers, which is increased melee attack during battles against barbarian tribes, and Romanization, increased cultural conversion. The drawback was increased public order penalties due to the presence of foreign culture. So, all three Roman families, they basically get a, a starting year of 278 BCE. The starting challenge is easy, and I'm going to put the game difficulty on very hard. One thing about DEI is that the game is actually balanced around normal game difficulty. That means a normal map difficulty and a normal battle difficulty. The map difficulty you can change and it It'll make the AI more aggressive, that's all it does. The AI is more likely to either engage in, you know, war with you, backstab you, try to take an empty city, something like that. The battle difficulty, on the other hand, when that's increased, it's going to increase the enemy unit's stats. So when you have, like, your regular troops versus an enemy levy troops, the levies actually might be stronger than your regular troops because of how it works out. So I will be playing the game difficulty on very hard, but when I get into the game, I will be changing the battle difficulty to normal. Uh, one thing I did want to go over was that the 
gens, it's, it's per, you know, spelled G-E-N-S, so some people might say gens, uh, that might be from where generation come from, but gens was defined as people descended from a common ancestor. So the Gens Julia came from the Julii clan, right? The Julii ancestor. Um, it's defined as either race or nation, but then further defined as either clan, kin, or tribe. I'm gonna choose to kind of define it as just family for now. That's their familial line. They date back to this family that founded Rome. So if we're gonna use uh, Caesar as an example, Caesar's full name was Gaius Julius Caesar. Gaius being a praenomenia or a praenomen that was usually limited and traditional and it was rare or unusual. So you see in the king's period in the Republic there were only a handful of uh, praenomen and that was just kind of like your quote-unquote first name. Then there was Julius that was your gens and that was kind of your family name and it could either be the one family like you could just have your individual family or you could have the family at large the entire Julii clan and then you can have distinct either plebeian or patrician lines as part of that clan. The last name, the Caesar, that was more of a cognomen, and that was kind of a, a nickname or something that was hereditary, or in other cases it'd be what's called an agnomen, which is what was assigned to a general. So Julius Caesar was actually just Gaius Julius, or Gaius Julius, apologies, the, uh, the Latin pronunciation snuck in there. So Gaius Julius was what he was known as, his friends might call him Gaius, other people would call him Julius, Julius. But then upon his ascension, he was assigned the cognomen Caesar, because he only had the two names. You have other people like Quintus, Cecilius, Metellus, Macedonicus. So he had four names. So his name was Quintus, Cecilius, Metellus. There was your praenomen, your gens, and your cognomen. But he was also assigned Macedonicus, which is an agnomen. And that was because he conquered the area known as Macedon. So, there's a quick example of basic Roman naming conventions. It can be confusing, because here in America you have your first, middle, and last name. Yes, we use three names, but it's kind of in a different order. For them, you had your first name, then the family name would have been your last name, then the last name would have been a cognomen based on either a physical feature, or the agnomen based on something you've done. So a lot of people were named after, like, were you red-handed, or yeah, red-handed, were you right-handed, did you have red hair? things like that. So, I think that satisfies what I wanted to do on this screen, so we're just going to go ahead and start up the campaign. Each one of these loading screens comes with some quotes at the bottom. So, great empires are not maintained by Timidy. Tacitus, Roman historian, AD 56 to 117. As you can see, they flash pretty quickly. Right here it says DEI includes a customized version of Traits, Talents, and Toadies mod. So you don't need to use both. That basically means the you know, Traits that in general or uh, Governor or any unit gets basically is updated. Later on, the uh, spotlight I'm going to cover is going to be the founding of Rome. So after we get into the game, we're going to read a little bit, go over some of our event messages, and then hit up the founding of Rome. Alright, we've loaded in. You are Rome. You have recently defeated the other Italian powers and their local Celtic allies. After forcing their city-states to become allies of Roma, the influence of our great city now stretches into central and northern Italia. However, a new foe has rallied to the cause of the Greek city-states of southern Italia. Pyrrhus of Epirus stands ready to hold back Roma from dominion over the peninsula. In Sicily, Syracuse and Carthage wage their own war for territory, so conflict with them is inevitable if you wish to expand across the Mediterranean. Otherwise, they may prove useful allies against the Greeks to the east or the Gaulish tribes to the north. Come what may, Rome will triumph. So that was your prompt for starting the game as Rome. First thing we're going to do here is check out our event messages. You'll see that there's a whole bunch of ones at the top that are basically character personality reports. All of your generals that are currently on the field, you know, everyone in your family, they're assigned character personality traits. So we'll review them when we go over each person. If we did them all now, we'd have to go through about 
80 traits, and that's a lot. A couple things I do want to know are the changes that happen in the EI. So the first one is going to be the population system. So Divide et Impera now includes a population system. Before you get conquering, take a moment to read how these new mechanics work and what new challenges lie ahead of you. Population is region-based and represents the fighting age male population divided into four classes, nobles, warriors, commoners, and foreigners, with differing classifications for cultures. All units will require population to recruit, and the population class needed will be dependent on the units you recruit. Replenishment and garrisons also consume population. So what that means is in the base game, you could recruit armies out of thin air, and they, they would just naturally replenish. You didn't need a population. You could just, you know, like I said, replenish out of thin air. The game here is trying to introduce an element of realism by saying you actually have to pull these people from somewhere. You can't just conquer an area, instantly heal your army up and head out the next turn. You either need to wait for the factors here that I'm going to read that can help. That's either going to be population growth, so, you know, those four classes might grow, immigration, those classes might immigrate from a nearby province. Economics, how the population class grows due to how the economy is run. Conquest, and that's it. So, what that means is when you raise an army, I'm going to click on Roma here, for example. There'll be a pop-up, but we can read it later. I'm going to scroll over Roma and region population. Population classes. Patricii, 2,472. Plebis. 7,356. Proletarii, 38,323. Peregrini, 4,590, for a total population of 52,741. That means that if you want to recruit units from the patrician class, you only have 2,472 people to do so. The plebs, likewise, 7,356. So every person you lose in a battle needs to be replaced by another person. And if you are either fighting too many wars or you're losing too many people, and attrition becomes high, you might not have the body count to replace those units that were lost. So that's the introduction of the population system. They've also added a supply system. So every army, more than a single general on the campaign map, now requires supplies. Regions provide supplies based on their fertility rating found under province effects. You can check each region's supplies by mousing over the supply icon at the top right of the province panel. So once again, we'll go back to Rome here. We checked out the region population. This is your population growth. Doesn't It's, it's a lot of interesting statistics, but it's highly complicated, so we're just going to ignore it. Here's your region supplies. Your total supplies are 200 out of 420. So the city of Rome produces nine supplies. This turn, zero will be consumed. The total supply change will be plus nine. It has a high fertility. The season is winter, and the regional supplies are 80 out of 220. The faction storage is 120 out of 200. So every time you have an army inhabiting the area of Rome, it will eat up supplies. And what this does is make it so if you have two or three armies just sitting in that area, it's actually going to use up more supplies than the region has, and there'll start to be negative effects because of that. Like I said, we clicked on Rome and had a pop-up, so we're going to read that pop-up real quick. Roma also known as Rome, the city that would be the master of the known world, has its founding steeped in myth and legends. According to the legend, the city was founded by Romulus on the Palatine Hill after consulting the augurs about the will of the gods. But the historical and archaeological version tells that the region before Rome was populated by Latin peoples from around 1000 BCE. The first settlement that would be Rome was on the Palatine Hill, consisting of mud huts and herders. After coming into contact with the Greeks and Etruscans, the settlement grew to include the other surrounding hills and imbibed elements of these civilizations. And in time, the crude settlements transformed into a powerful city. So, that is Rome. Now, I'm thinking right now would be a good time to do our spotlight. Remember, each episode is going to have this spotlight. It's kind of a little bit of a historical dive into Rome. And the spotlight for this episode is going to be the founding of Rome. So we're going to start off with the Aeneid. The Aeneid was the epic that kind of defined the foundation of Rome. It gave it that mythological aspect. 
So it was written by Virgil between 29 and 19 BCE. It's probably considered to be Virgil's masterpiece and one of the greatest works of Latin culture. So, what is the Aeneid? It was a story about Aeneas, a Trojan warrior who fled the fall of Troy and traveled to Italy where he subjugated the local Latin people. So we're going to assume Troy fell in 1184 BCE. That's where the kind of archaeological evidence dates the city of Troy, you know, if it existed as founding. So that's when his journey starts in 1184 BCE. The first half of the Aeneid is his basically journey to Italy. He sails from Troy, which is located in Asia Minor. And he has an adventure. He stops at different islands, talks with different peoples, encounters different things before eventually making his way to the Tiber and eventually the area of Rome. In the second part of the book, he that's where he covers the victories over the Latin. So he lands there and he actually subjugates the Latin people. Now he doesn't necessarily found Rome. This is just a, what I'm going to call it, a myth or a national epic that ties Rome to the legend of Troy. So Romans, just like you know their Greek counterparts, love stories. They love a way to give themselves a bigger than life, right? A mythological tie. So in that area, right, written between 29 and 19 BCE, that was when you had transitioned from the Republic to the Empire, and there was a very, very heightened set of nationalism. You wanted to have a founding that was mythological, that you can tie to something. So that's why Virgil wrote the Aeneid, featuring Aeneas. Definitely a good read. I would 100% recommend it. If I went over the Aeneid, I would be here for like three hours, so I just gave you the very, very condensed version. Next, we're going to look at one of those founding stories. So there were multiple, but the most famous one, which we just read, you know, the actual founding of the city of Rome, was by Romulus and Remus. So the Aeneid gives us a mythological tie, but it doesn't actually found the city. It just gives us that tie. So it was founded around 750 BCE. The date given is April 21st, 753 BCE is when the city was founded. There's no way in actual knowing if that's the actual date, but it's commonly accepted. So this I'm going to say historical fact slash fiction, was written around the 3rd century BCE. So Romulus and Remus were born in Alba Longa. We had talked about that earlier. That's where the Julii family hails from. Their mother was Rhea Silva. She was a Vestal Virgin, the daughter of former King Numitor, and he had been replaced by a guy named Amulius, which was his brother. So his brother, seeing that these two sons were born, viewed them as a threat, and ordered them killed. Now, who their father is, is well ambiguous. Most people would say that his father was the god of Mars, and that she was visiting either a temple or a sacred grove of Mars, where he impregnated her, and there you go, Remus and Remus are born. That would make them demigods, which ties us back to that kind of fiction or mythological story that people really enjoy try to, not necessarily, but potentially the ancestor of Aeneas. As time goes along, these oral and written stories get changed. So after the Aeneid was written between 29 and 19 BCE, this story then tied Rhymus and Remus to Aeneas. So, what happens to them? Well, they're ordered killed, right? But they were saved by Tiburnius, the father of the river, and at the site that would later become Rome. So a she-wolf found them, and basically provided nourishment to the twins in their infancy. She brought them back to a cave named Lupercal and raised them there. Eventually they were found and basically some stuff happened. I won't go into it because I do will be here forever. But they helped their grandfather get restored to the throne. So then they helped put Numitor back on the throne in Alba Longa and set out to found their own city. So as they were traveling they eventually found what would become the future founding of Rome. Romulus wanted to settle on the Palatine Hill, and Remus wanted to settle on the Aventine Hill. So when you have an argument and you can't figure it out and no side's going to budge, what do you do? You go to the gods. You draw upon the augurs and you see who is favored. Well, as the story goes, 
Rhymulus saw some birds and then Remus saw some more birds and it was basically a tit for tat back and forth so nothing was solved what happens well Rhymulus and Remus end up getting in a fight and Rhymulus kills Remus now there is a lot of once again historical faction you know like factor fiction but there's a story that as Romulus and Remus were both building their separate cities, Remus jumps over the infant stages of Romulus's walls, right? They're like a foot high. And he's like, my walls will hold. And Remus is like, haha, I jumped over them. What will you do now? And Romulus says, any invader that jumps over these walls gets killed, and he kills his brother. Once again, a fanciful story. Either way, Romulus ends up founding the city of Rome on the Palatine Hill on the date April 21st, 753. BCE. So, we covered the Aeneid, we covered the Remus and Remus, now I want to cover a little bit about Rome. So, in Latin, it was called Roma. That was the name of the city. We will call it Rome, just because it's easier. It was known as the Eternal City. It started off as a small village on the banks of the Tiber. So, as the prompt had said earlier, it was a very small, primarily herding, agricultural village. Now, it eventually developed trade because it was settled on the Tiber, and the Tiber was a navigable waterway. You can see here in the map, there is a waterway that goes right through the city of Rome. On top of sitting on a navigable waterway, it also sat perfectly placed between the Etruscans to the north and the Greeks to the south. So the Etruscans and the Greeks were most, both of them more culturally, I'm going to say, advanced than the Romans. The Romans were kind of a little bit backward. So trade would actually go through the city of Roma. And as it went through, cultural diffusion, right? We learned that all throughout high school, cultures would mix and match, things would be adopted. So that's one thing the Romans were actually incredibly good at. Rome was always, always, always good at borrowing and improving upon the skills and concept of other civilizations. They were highly, highly adaptable, which is one of the main reasons they lasted so long. When they either would conquer a foreign people or meet a foreign people, they would always would take things that they think would work well for them, and they would adapt them. They would maybe change a few things, but whatever worked well, they adopted. They really weren't the kind of people, at least early on, that would turn their nose up to other people just because they were different. If they had a better idea, they had a better idea. This was simply the way it was. So, the Greeks to the south, their culture heavily influenced Rome by art, architecture, religion, and literacy. So, the Roman pantheon, gods, are basically just copies of the Greek gods with different names. Architecture, incredibly the same. You can look at the columns, right, that are formed like the Senate. And even the art, the, the busts, it all comes from Greece. Now, the Etruscans to the north, they modeled on trade and luxury. So while the Greeks did trade, the Etruscans were a lot closer to Rome, and a lot more goods flowed in from Etruria to Rome. So those trade goods and luxuries had an influence on Roman culture. They also had a lot more war with the Etruscans, because the Etruscans were a lot closer. The city of Veii, I think, was only a few miles away from the city of Rome, so... As you could imagine, there were constant border skirmishes. Now, the extent of the Etruscan influence on Rome isn't completely known. It's still debated, but it's safe to say that there was a pretty big cultural, con not necessarily conversion, but diffusion happening between the two cultures. And that's kind of what caused Rome to grow from a bunch of herders and farmers that lived in mud huts to, you know, they started to build stone buildings. They started to build walls. Yes, they still farmed. But then they started to trade, and then they became very, very warlike because of the constant interaction with the Etruscans to the north. If you're constantly skirmishing every year, well, you're going to start to become more of a martial empire. And early on, Rome was the small fish in the big sea. The Etruscans, much bigger, much more civilized, much more advanced. Same with the Greeks. But the thing is, the Romans were unique in that they were on the Tiber. They were located centrally between the Greeks and the Etruscans. And neither the Greeks nor the Etruscans really bothered them heavily. They really weren't looking to be conquered. So because of that, they were allowed to survive, whereas they might have not if, you know, the Greeks or the Etruscans simply rolled in early on and just leveled the city. 
So yeah, that's our spotlight. That's a little bit about the founding of Rome. So we're going to move on to our last event message that I want to play, which is every winter there'll be an event message called the year in history. So this year in history, 278 BCE. Basically, the Debs of DEI included this. So it's a little what happened in the year. So what happened in the year 278 BCE? You had the Roman consuls and Greek archontes. The consuls were C. Fabricius Lucianus and Q. Emilius Pappus. The archon was Democles. Births. Polynaeus of Lampascus, the Greek mathematician and philosopher and friend of Epicurus. So those were your consuls, archontes, and births. So then it goes on to what's basically happening in the world. The Seleucid Empire. After their defeats in Greece, the Gauls move into Asia Minor. The Seleucid king Antiochus wins a major battle over the Gauls, leading to his being given the title of Sotor, Greek for savior. The Gauls settle down to become the Galatians and are paid 2,000 talents annually by the Seleucid kings to keep the peace. Antigonus concludes a peace with Antiochus, who surrenders his claim to Macedonia. Thereafter, Antigonus II's foreign policy is marked by friendship with the Seleucids. Nicomedes I becomes the first ruler of Bithynia to assume the title of king. He founds the city of Nicomedia, which soon rises to great prosperity. So what happened there is you had some Gauls that made their way over towards the Seleucid area. They were beaten, but then they settled in Galatia, and that's how you get some of that Celtic influence on the Asia Minor area. They basically settled the central area. We'll eventually get there when we're conquering, but for now, that's all you need to know. Eventually, the Antigonus, that's Macedon, comes into contact with Antiochus, that is the Seleucids, and they kind of form a loose peace treaty, like we won't go after each other's territory, so I guess it's closer to a non-aggression pact, but then when they each encounter their own problems, they turn to each other like, hey, you want to be friends? And they get some friends. Sicily. The Carthaginians seize an, import, an opportunity to interfere in a quarrel between Syracuse and Agrigentum and besiege Syracuse. The Syracusans ask for help from Pyrrhus, and Pyrrhus transfers his army there. The Mamertines make an alliance with the Carthaginians and try to stop Pyrrhus crossing to Sicily. On his arrival in Sicily, Pyrrhus' forces win battles against the Carthaginians across Sicily. Pyrrhus conquers almost all of Sicily except for Lilybaeum, that's Mar Marsala. Pyrrhus is proclaimed king of Sicily. He plans for his son, Hellenus, to inherit the kingdom of Sicily and his other son, Alexander, to inherit Italy. So I'm going to go over this on the map here, just to show you guys what's up, and I'll also, you know, narrate it so you can follow. So, here's Syracuse. Agrigentum would have been located in this area right here. Also, this is another thing that's annoying. I love that the clouds are still in the game. You can't see it, but there's a giant cloud over where a city would be. So I have to, like, zoom in super to show you that the city of Agrigentum would have been located somewhere here. So, Syracuse, in-game known as... Seracusae and Agrigentum had a conflict. Carthage gets involved. They take the side of Agrigentum, so they push back the Syracusans. So Syracuse goes up to Pyrrhus and asks for help. Pyrrhus is like, sure. Marches on down, and he helps. The Mamertines make an alliance. So the Mamertines were up here, located here. You'll see this is where you can cross, right here. There's uh, basically two harbors on the map. It means your army can cross without a navy. They cross, and the Mamertines try to stop them here, at the northeast portion of Sicily. And they were unsuccessful, and then Pyrrhus basically conquers all of Sicily. The only thing that holds out would be Lilybaeum, which is a city that's on the very, very western coast. So right here, it's like a garrison city. That is the only city that would hold out in this conflict. Lastly, we have the Roman Republic. The Roman garrison at Regium mutinies and seizes the town. Regium is located right here. It was a very important city that you stopped at before crossing into Sicily. So that was where Regium was. And then Egypt, the deification of Ptolemy I and Berenice and the first celebration of Ptolemaea. So that is this year in history, 278 BCE. And that covers our event messages. So that's all that I really had planned for this episode. So I think we're just going to hold there for now. 
we'll we'll do a couple more cities. There's a couple more cities that have prompts here. So we'll click on Syracuse, and that is the city of Syracuse on the island of Sicily. Very important city in real life. It became an ally of Rome and stayed an ally of Rome for a very long time. They really helped support Rome in the First Punic War. So, Syracuse. The city of Syracuse, or Syracuse, is located on the east coast of Sicily. The Mediterranean island of Sicily, with its natural resources and strategic position on trading routes, aroused the int intense interest of successive empires from Carthage to Athens to Rome. Consequently, the island is never far from center stage in regional politics and was very often a theater of war throughout the centuries. Syracuse is the most important city of Magna Graecia. So that's the little prompt about it. I didn't do too much research in Syracuse. We'll do a little deep dive on them later. But Syracuse, very, very important in early Rome. Now, I say Syracuse, I am from upstate New York, so those of you that know upstate New York know that there's a city called Syracuse, right up there, Syracuse University, SU, and that's where the name comes from. There's actually a lot of names in upstate New York that come from the ancient world. We have a Rome, right? We have a Carthage, we have Virgil, we have all sorts of cities in basically central, south central, and northern central New York that are named after ancient areas. Down here close to where I live, we actually have a place called Vestal, named after, as you guessed it, the Vestal Virgins. We're going to boop on up to Massalia. So, Massalia. This was another Greek colony. This was, I think, one of the furthest north Greek colonies. Along the northwestern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, between Spain and Italy, lies the ancient city of Massalia. The presence of Greek culture, especially its architecture and art, at Massalia had a lasting effect from Gaul in the northwest and Spain to the far west. This influence became more evident with the arrival of Greek wine and olives as agricultural products. Although the city remained Greek in nature, complete with a theater, agora, temples, and docks, its location kept it from participating in any of the Greek wars in the homeland. So as that prompt said, Massalia was far enough away from Hellas that they didn't really have to deal with it. Same thing with Syracuse. They were far enough away that they didn't actively participate in any wars, but they were attacked during the Peloponnesian War. They were very successful in fending off the attack, but because they were so far away, you know, an entire sea away, it was tough to, you know, put several thousand men on troops, feed them, and then row them over to attack a city on a separate island. Lastly, we'll cover our good friends Carthage, also known here as Kart Hadashit. So I'm not sure if that's the Latin name for them. So that's what the Romans would have called them. But we're going to stick with the famous Carthage. So Carthage, or Kart Hadashit, new city. The queen of the Mediterranean is a resplendent commercial metropolis with multi story buildings, refugent temples, libraries, marketplaces, and a glorious dual harbor which is an architectural marvel for all to see. Its central position in the Mediterranean makes it an ideal base for sea trade. This city of gifted sailors and talented merchants is encircled by massive walls. According to legend, Carthage was founded by the Phocian queen Alyssa more than 500 years ago. Phoenician queen Alyssa. I call them the Phocians sometimes, but they should be called the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians were a trading group of people from the Syria area that founded this colony here more than 500 years ago. So that would make it founded around the time of, of Rome, I would be guessing. But Carthage here, located right on this kind of, you know, the nape of what would be modern day Tunisia that points out into the Mediterranean, very popular place to stop. Just like Syracuse, you know, these ancient travel was a lot different. So these ships would have to stop at harbors, they would trade, they would, you know, get supplies, and then they would move on. So you wouldn't just sail from Athens over to Massalia. You would maybe stop at Carth you know, stop at Syracuse, stop at Carthage, maybe stop at Carolus, and then go on over to Massalia. Rome itself was not on the sea. They had the famous port of Ostia. So everything that came to Rome came through the port of Ostia. Rome was 
I don't want to say well inland, but it was well enough inland that it was not considered a port city. So, I think I'm happy. That covers the event messages that I wanted to cover. We read the four prompts from the four cities that we clicked on, and then we covered our spotlight on the founding of Rome. So that's going to end this episode. Thanks everyone for listening, and I hope to see you next time. Have a good one.